Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, wanted to make a quick video. Uh, being attacked. Are we always being attacked? And someone attacked me and I wrote the, the attacks down and I decided like I always push brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't get mad. Don't get bitter. Don't get into the backbiting and the arguing and the debating. What you do is you turn it into a Bible study. I've always preached this. Okay, turn to Jeremiah 9.24. I've already got turned to start us out with. But um, I get attacks every once in a while by certain people, and it seems to be the same people. You'll notice that a lot of the bold, prideful people, and they're, they're not really attacking me, they're attacking God's Word. And when they can't handle what God's Word says, then they turn to attacking me personally. Okay. So, um, so I made some comments. I want to read the comments. I, don't want to, I, I, I thought about doing the video where you can see the screen and I can show you every comment and everything, but I don't want to distract from this study. Okay, I want to keep it about the Word of God. So I'm going to na say some of the comments she made and then show the Bible study that I did and God showed His Word to me. And I want to share it with you, brother and sister in Christ. So turn to Jeremiah 9, 24. The first comment that I wanted to respond to is this. She says, this is a woman on there, that she portrayed herself to be a Christian way back when. She used to support King James Video Ministries. And she put on this great show that I'm a Christian. And she's not. She showed her true colors. She was, I'll, I'll go into this real quick because I want to get into the study, but I'll go into this real quick. She supported two ministries. These are both godly men. One ministry preached repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Backed by scripture, that's the plan of salvation this preacher preached. This other preacher preached no repentance, it's only believe, only believe, no prayer, just belief, just head belief. You believe and you're saved. Two different plans of salvation. And when one of them got called out, she got shown to be a hypocrite. Okay, a flat out hypocrite. They both don't teach the same plan of salvation. So she picked one side, her true self, her true color came out, the easy believism side, and she now attacks hardcore the men who preach repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and confess both in prayer and ask God to save. That's the plan of salvation. The changed life gospel that we're going to be talking about. The changed life gospel. They're against it. They attack it. Why? Because they love their life. We already did a teaching, I did a teaching on this, uh, Tears Lives Matter, where I go through and explain that that old man, the reason people don't want to get saved is that old man, that sinful, wicked person that you are, they love that person. They have no problem with that person. They don't want to give up that person. And that's who we're dealing with here. So, one of the comments she made was, this King, J King James, KJV, Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries. The reason I did that title wasn't because I wanted a title. The reason I did that was because I wanted to encourage the other men in ministry that you need to make sure that's who you are and what your ministry is based off of. Okay, That you're a Bible believer. You believe in the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. That's who you preach. Bible believing, God fearing, your life that you live, instruction and righteousness, the do's and the don'ts, the changed life. You're living it and that's what you're preaching. Every ministry out there should be a Bible-believing, God-fearing ministry. That's why I chose that. Okay. Um, so she's addressing it to me. Uh, you do not know the true gospel, Philip. Like I said, this woman, I knew her. The woman she portrayed herself to be. We used to pray for each other. We used to throw scriptures back and forth. And I thought, you know, she put on this great show that she was saved. But like I said, she made a choice. She was kept promoting this other guy that was preaching a false gospel, a false plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. So she says, "That's how she knows me by name, because the Lord has blinded you. The Lord has blinded you. Mm -hmm. You do not know the true gospel, brothers and sisters Christ. I have to correct myself. I used to say that the true gospel. Everybody pre preaches the true gospel: death, burial, and resurrection." But I need to be more specific. People verbally say the true gospel. 
death, burial, resurrection, how he died, death, burial, resurrection. There's a lot of people out there that say it. But what we're going to learn in this study is with the lives that they live, they deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. So she makes this saying, I don't know the gospel. Well, Jeremiah 9, 24. I'm always going to start with this, brother, this is Christ. I learned, God showed me through the scriptures, that it's not enough to know the gospel. You have to understand it. They say you miss heaven by 13 inches. It's up here. You know the gospel, but you don't understand the gospel. 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 8, 6? There's but one God, the Father, and there's one Lord, capital L Lord, Jesus Christ. Who's the I am the Lord? It's Jesus Christ. He was always there in the Old Testament. But people will deny that. So it's no other thing. But which exercises loving kindness, the gospel, judgment. You know, uh, we preach the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne, and that all judgment's been given to Jesus Christ, and Jesus will judge the world. Okay. Judgment and righteousness in the earth. Jesus is the only one that's righteous. You need His righteousness imputed to you. You need Him to wash your sins away. Okay. For in these three, these things I delight, saith the Lord. I delight in them. He delights in people that know Him and understand Him. So when you have someone say, you don't know the true gospel, the true gospel, the true gospel... You get kind of confused, brothers and sisters of Christ, because they teach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We teach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What's the difference? Paul lets us know the difference. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. The infamous 1 Corinthians 15. They'll use 1 Corinthians 15, as we see in this study. She's going to turn around and say, what when I use Corinthians where it talks about repentance towards God, godly sorrow that's written to save people, only save people can have it. Yet we're reading the gospel right here and yet it's written to save people. So this gospel is only for saved people, right? By their same understanding. It's just what's it all based off of? The no change life gospel. They love their life. The old man, the old woman they love their sin. They ain't giving it up. That's what it's all about. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. So we know that you have to know and understand the Lord. The gospel is important. You need to know and understand the gospel. The loving kindness. Okay, the judgment. The righteousness. You need to know it and understand it. So let's read it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you previously... Remember, Romans, I believe with all my heart, Romans is an overview of Paul's ministry, where he's going and he's preaching to the Corinthians, um, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, Thessalonians. It's an overview of his whole ministry. Okay? He previously preached it, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if, <coughs> here we go again, they, they just they hate this verse, the if verse. But which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. What's the if part? Wherein ye stand? But is it down here? Oh, I believe the gospel, the true gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ up here. But is it down here? And he goes through and actually flat out says, this is what the gospel is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay. How he died, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. People say, that's what I preach. That's what I preach. These people, like this woman here that's attacking me, that's what she preaches. But that's what I preach. 
That's what Brother Brian preaches. That's what Catholicism preaches. That's what Mormons preach. That's what Jehovah's Witness preaches. That's what, you know, I keep going on. All these different denominations. That's what they preach. What's the difference? We're going to get to that. They all attack the change life gospel. They all attack the sealed until the day of redemption. Mm -hmm. You're sealed until the day of redemption, but they'll use that to hide their old man, saying, I can, I'm going to keep my old man, but anytime someone tries to judge me, I'm sealed until the day of redemption. Are you saying I've lost my salvation? No, I'm saying you never had it to begin with. And that just takes them by surprise. Look, no, you never had it to begin with. I'm not saying you lost your salvation. You never had it to begin with. Now, what's the vein here? We always talk about you can believe in vain, you can believe in vain, but what's the vein here? 1 Corinthians 15.12, you go down to verse, 1 Corinthians 15.12, and it starts talking about it. What's it talking about? <clears throat> now, if Christ be preached, he just told us what the gospel was. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Remember that, resurrection of the dead. There's no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Oh, you believe that the death, burial, and resurrection, but you don't believe in the new man. There's people who don't believe in the resurrection the, of all the saints that came up with Jesus Christ when he was first resurrected. You know, there's people who don't believe in the resurrection at the catching away of the body of Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which remain shall be caught up to be with them in the clouds, to be with them in the air. Yeah. But I already gave it away. The new person. What about that resurrection? It says here, I'll read 13 over again, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain? You say, what's going on with these Gospels? They're preaching a resurrectionless Gospel with the life they're living and the life that they promote in these so-called converts. No changed life. Let's take repentance out. No changed life. There's no... What happens when you take the changed life out? Okay? No changed life Gospel. No resurrection Gospel. That's what Paul's saying. Okay? Your belief is in vain. How do we know this? Right, turn to Romans 6 1. And please, brothers and sisters Christ, keep doing more studies than this. I just ran, I'm just going over this with God through it. I gave it to me real quick. Okay? And I've been praying about it and going through it, and we could have done a big study, but I got some other studies I want to get into, and I've defended the gospel so much. The true gospel, the change life gospel. And God just brought this to my attention. That's the difference. Everybody tries to preach verbally the same gospel, but they're not really preaching the same gospel when they take out the changed life. There's no changed life gospel. And that changed life is a physical change. You start living a life of Christ. You are in Christ Jesus, unto, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's the changed life. It's not going from unbelief to belief, where one minute you didn't believe, now you believe, and that's the changed life. But you can continue living in sin and keep that old man or that old, man, old woman alive and kicking uh, no, that's not the new birth. But Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue, continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So we preach this so much to them and they just, whoo, right over their heads. When you get saved, you're not going to want to continue in sin anymore. You're not going to want to live in sin. You're not going to be carnally minded and walking after the flesh. First Corinthians, uh, Romans 8. Sorry, Romans 8. You're not going to be uh, carnally minded and walking after the flesh. You're going to be spiritually minded walking after the capital S, Spirit. Jesus comes in tells you what to do and you're going to do it. You're not going to want to walk in sin anymore. You're going to want to please God with your life. Every, every, I'll say it again, every aspect of your life. There's nothing you're holding back for yourself. Live any longer therein. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? The old man is dead and buried. 
Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up, we are resurrected and raised up. From the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The likeness of his resurrection. What's going on in First and Second Corinthians? People are coming in and telling them that you don't have to have a changed life. You can continue in sin. You can do whatever you want. Just say you believe in the big guy upstairs. Which is so disrespectful. I used to say that all the time. So disrespectful. It's not the big guy upstairs. What did we just read in Jeremiah 9.24? Understand and know of me that I am the Lord. The Lord. It's not the big guy upstairs. It's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's Jesus who is God fully and completely and is going to judge me and judge the world. Everybody's getting judged one day, whether at the judgment seat of Christ or at the great white throne. Amen. Verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. What's going on here? The old man is dead and buried. The new man is resurrected. Jesus gives you a new life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let's see if I have it here. I do. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. The old man's dead and buried. Every aspect of your life belongs to the Lord. All things become new. It's 100% about Jesus Christ. You're spiritually minded walking after the Spirit. You give God thanks in everything. And if you can't give Him thanks in it, you shouldn't be doing it. You give God glory in everything. If you can't give God glory in it, you shouldn't be doing it. Whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.1 reads, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened, made alive. Colossians 2.13 also says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Yeah. He forgives you. And then he puts you on the right path. The Bible says that narrow is the path to heaven, and wide and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be in, but narrow is the way, and very few there be that find it. Why is that? Because everybody loves the old man. They don't want to give up the old man. And when you get saved, brother, sister in Christ, you're going to realize that sometimes, sometimes, in your saved life, the Bible warns us but not about not resurrecting the old man. There are certain areas in our life we start to hold on to that it's like, no, we're supposed to give that to God and change. We hold on to this over here. We hold on to that. No, we got to let it go. You're starting to resurrect the old man. Be careful. That old man's supposed to be dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man's resurrected. So what are we seeing here? What's going on, I believe... And I've taught this, and they will never, these people who attack us won't take you through First and Second Corinthians and show you all the times that he's doubting their salvation. Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. You have to prove yourselves. You have to be approved. If any man be in Christ. You know, if any man be in Christ. If a man be called a brother. If, if, if. That's called doubt. It's a stipulation. Here's the if. And this is what makes the if possible. Do you guys line up with this? Mm -hmm. We're doing a, a series we'll get back to, uh, Bible Ifs uh, for Instruction Righteousness. We're just going through every Bible if there is, showing that there's a condition. In order for that if to apply, there's a condition. And Paul's saying it to him like he's doubting, and he is doubting their salvation. Time and time again. He comes to them and sees them. They look like the world, act like the world. They're doing some very wicked, wicked sin. 
and he's doubting their salvation. Okay. Uh, no changed life gospel. No resurrection gospel. That's the whole point, brothers and sisters. Christ. When we say they teach another gospel, it's not that they teach, because they always say we teach a false gospel. We teach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We say they teach a false gospel. They teach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what are we talking about when they teach a false gospel? They're teaching a no-changed life gospel. And when there's no changed life in your life, you're rejecting the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the life you're living. If you're not that new man, that new creature in Christ Jesus, living for Jesus, being created in Christ Jesus, time and time again, you're in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ Jesus. You need to live that way. Okay, you have to prove yourself. It's not about words, it's about deeds also. And word and deed do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Word and deed. What are they doing? They're denouncing the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the life that they're living. They're supposed to be raised with Jesus Christ, a new creature in Christ Jesus, a new man, a new woman. And when that new man and that new woman's not there, by the life they're living, they're denouncing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.1 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What's going on here? We already read it. He's, he's preaching the gospel to the, to, the, to the people who profess to be saved. He's preaching the gospel. He's coming to them and saying, hey, this is what we're going to read here. He's coming to them and saying, hey, something's going on here. I'm... You're supposed to be only worshiping the Jesus Christ that I'm telling you about. But for today, we say that Jesus Christ is the King James Bible. That's why you hear us say that so much. That Jesus Christ is the King James Bible, which we preach, we look at you and go, that's not who you're following. There's no changed life, and you're denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ by not having a changed life. Something's not right. You didn't get saved. You're still holding on to that old man, that old woman. You're holding on to a life that doesn't matter. The new life is what matters, not the old life. Amen. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through the, his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You're going to go to hell. You're going to bear with who's to him? The serpent. You're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. And notice it says, through minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, through his subtlety. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We preach the same gospel that they do. We, we, preach, this, we preach the same gospel. That's probably how it first started way, way, way back when. We preach the same gospel as you do, and then over time they chucked repentance, they chucked prayer, and then they chucked the changed life. And then some of them just changed the definition of the changed life. Oh, and, and repentance. It's just going from unbelief to belief. That's what's going on here. You've got these people out here that are attacking me, they're probably attacking you, but ultimately they're attacking the Word of God. And what they're really saying, brothers and sisters in Christ, I love my old self, the old man, the old woman. That woman is the one that's going to be in charge. That man's the man that's going to be in charge. I'm not giving him up. And I've been told I can just say I believe in the big guy upstairs and it's okay. Uh, no, it's not okay. You're still going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. You have to come to the foot of a cross, broken, and this person attacked me by using the word broken. Broken, throwing your, that, low, that old man, that old woman, you're throwing that at the foot of the cross. Your iniquities, that sinful, wicked life, you're throwing it at the foot of the cross. 
And then that belief that that knowledge, that head knowledge, becomes heartfelt understanding when you believe in Jesus Christ, that you died for me and my sins. You, then you can say that, that they, He died for you and that he, can wa that he can wash your sins away. And you ask God to save you. Lord, save me. Why is this, why are people attacking this so hard? I used to, there was a time, Brother Jesus Christ, I used to ask, why are people attacking this so hard? And over time, God's revealed it to me. They attack it so hard, Brother Jesus Christ, because they love the old man. They love the old woman. They're not throwing that old man or that old woman at the foot of the cross. That old man, no, I'm not crucifying that old man or that old woman with Jesus Christ. Oh no, I love that old man. That's why. That's why these people, prideful, going about to establish their own righteousness, just attack, attack, attack the changed life gospel. The true gospel, when we say the true gospel, the gospel that leads to a changed life after salvation. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You, for, you, for we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. All right. Time and time again, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus our Lord. Time and time again. But they'll keep attacking this. So Bible study, brothers and sisters Christ, always go to the Bible, always go to the Bible. I'm not the final authority. Okay, God's Word is. What's going on with this Gospel? When they say that I'm preaching another Gospel, I'm preaching a gospel that you don't only confess with your mouth the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you prove it with the life that you're living. Prove your own selves, by, uh, Paul tells the Corinthians. Prove your own selves whether you be in the faith. Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Prove it with the life you're living. Oh, I don't have to prove it with the life I'm living. Because Why are they saying that? Because the life they're living proves that they reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Okay. One of the things, just another thing that she hits me with, um, is we do not have to be broken, only convicted. And you do not know the difference. I do know the difference. She doesn't. A man can be convicted and still continue on and do what he's doing. Convicted doesn't mean that there's a change. Okay, you'll be convicted and you can choose to ignore your conscience. Your conscience can be seared like a hot iron to where you've ignored it long, you've fought it to the point of ignoring it to now you don't hear anything. It's probably still there, a small whisper, but you don't hear it. What, what's going on there? They're being convicted, but they're ignoring that conviction. They're rejecting that conviction. But let's read only one time, and they'll bring it, they'll say, they'll make that comment. We don't have to be broken, only convicted, and you don't know the difference. I'm saying it like that because like she's got an attitude, and she does. She's got a serious attitude problem. And we see this, it's like, okay, then quote from Scripture where it says convicted. When I typed in convicted, I'll do it again. Convicted is only in the Bible once. Let's turn to John chapter 8, verse 1. Let's look at this. And why she and people like her won't show you this. Now remember, this whole time period that Jesus walked on the earth, he's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the belief. He's their king and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not death, burial, and resurrection. I understand that. But he's, re he's preaching repent. And they like to just totally destroy what repent means. They love to do this. But let's look at this. He's preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John 8 verse 1. Jesus went un unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery and in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him. Now we can go through, I've already done studies on this, where 
They were not following the law themselves. They were failing to follow the law themselves. Okay? But let's get to the point of this study. Him. That they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And here's where we get to it. And they that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had left, lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto the woman, Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. There's your conviction. Those Pharisees and, sa and scribes, did they get saved? That's true repentance, right? Convictions, all true repentance is just conviction. No, they continued to attack Jesus Christ. They found other ways to trick him. What he wrote in the ground, some people say he wrote their names. I believe he wrote the law down, and then he wrote down that they weren't following the law. Where was the man at? Okay, you're supposed to take, if she was taken in the very act of adultery, where's the man at? You're supposed to stone the man and the woman, and you're supposed to do it in the gate. Not bring her to him, you're supposed to do it in the gate, if you were following the law, if they were following the law. And all of those men were probably the men that were with her, if you know what I mean. But the point is, is they were convicted because they got called out. Jesus called them out on the spot. And they walked away one by one. But did they have a change of heart? You keep reading, they come back with more attacks. Trying to find other ways to slip them up. They're the ones that crucified them. Took them and handed them over to be crucified. Okay? So that doesn't work. I understand what conviction is. You can be convicted. You can be convicted. But still continue in what you're doing. Yeah, I got convicted. Yeah, I feel a little bad about what I'm doing. And you still do it. It's that heartfelt change that needs to be there. That true repentance, that godly sorrow, that sorrow towards God for that sin that you're doing. Not just this conviction in your heart about, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't be doing it. Now. That needs to kind of be there. Don't get me wrong. But that conviction alone is not true repentance. And people keep saying it. No, she said broken. She doesn't understand. You don't understand the difference between broken and conviction. Oh, yes, I do. Those men there that we just read about were convicted. But they weren't broken. Uh, Matthew 21.44 Matthew 21.44 Let's start at 43. Therefore say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The changed life, yet again. But these people just, they love their old, the old man, the old woman. Verse 44. And whoso shall fall on this stone shall be broken. The stone is Jesus Christ. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You die in your sins, you go to hell. And you'll have to stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment, at the great white throne. I want to say the right one. At the great white throne, you're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. And you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. And you will burn for all eternal eternity. It's eternal damnation. Not the grave. It's not annihilation. It's going to ease my conscience if I say it's annihilation or it's the grave. You're going to find out the hard way when you die in your sins that it's everlasting. Okay. Now look at this. Verse 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. 
You mean the same ones that were convicted? Oh yeah, same ones that were convicted. They weren't broken. You don't have to turn here, but Luke 20.18 says it again. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. But whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. John 16.7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I not go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. You hear so many people say he's there to convict the world of sin. No, he's to reprove the world of sin. You say, what's the difference? Reprove is to show that you are a sinner. The conviction part's up to you. He's there to reprove the world and show the world that they are sinners. He showed me I was a sinner. He showed you, brother and sister Christ, that you were a sinner. And you came to the cross broken. Not only were you convicted, conviction can be there, but you had godly sorrow. And it's that godly sorrow that broke you. Jesus Christ, what He did on the cross, that's where it comes back to the cross. You have that heartfelt understanding because of my personal sins Jesus Christ died. He died for the sins of the world. He didn't die for the people of the world. He died for the sins of the world. He died because of my personal sins. They never get to that point. The Holy Spirit comes, comes along, shows them that they're sinners. I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. I stand at the door and knock. He shows them that they're sinners and that they're on their way to hell and they sin against God, their creator that loves that loved the world, past tense, but their creator that at one time, the past event, loved the world and they rejected. Eh, no, I don't need to change life. Oh, I'm not, I don't have to be sorry for sinning. It's just conviction. Oh, hey, the first and second Corinthians, they're being told, you know, you can continue in your sin. It's no big deal. There doesn't have to be a changed life. Paul comes in there and just sharply rebukes him and corrects him time and time again. How are we that are dead to sin? That's in Romans. Romans. But you get there, he's like, how can you guys be doing the sin? It's wrong. You need to check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. You're supposed to be living a changed life. Reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. That heartfelt conviction that leads to being broken, sorrow, godly sorrow, to the cross. All right? They believe not on me. Ten, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Resurrection. He also ascends up. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. They keep choosing the world over Jesus Christ. The world says, you can have the old man, keep the old man, and be a Christian. That's what the world says. We come along with love, and we say, the, Lord, the world's lying to you. Remember that verse I quoted about, um, they promised them liberty? It's in over in Peter. I think it's 2 Peter. They promise them liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption. We're telling you that the world, is, this professing Christian world, is lying to you. Okay? Here, let me show you the scriptures. Okay? You're supposed to repent. Come to God broken. Godly sorrow. Sorrow towards God. Okay? Sorrow towards God for your personal sins. They're telling you you don't have to do that. The Bible says you do. Mm -hmm. Get a little ahead of myself. Next thing, uh, get into the next thing, because I, mean, I am getting ahead of myself a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm very passionate about the plan of salvation, Brother Sister Christ, and I know a lot of you, Brother Sister Christ, are too. I want to see people get saved. I want to see my ex-wife get saved. I want to see Robert Breaker get saved. I want to see Edward P.F. get saved. I want to see King's Table get saved. I want to see Deborah Gill get saved. I want to see... I, want, I wish I could see everybody get saved. I, I, 
I wish that none should perish like God does. His will is that none should perish, that all should come to repentance. Repentance. Broken. Okay? Jesus is the chief cornerstone. You have to fall on Him and become broken. So He can give you a new life. He can make you whole. Next thing she says is, um, you add one lone verse in Corinthians about godly sorrow. No, we don't, but let's go with this one. Or about godly sorrow, yes. There is one verse that talks about, that's because like I said, in First and Second Corinthians, I thought she was saying repentance. We're going to get to that. Godly sorrow, remember, we get to First and Second Corinthians, you have people professing to be Christians that are carnally minded, walking after the flesh, those who are saved are getting messed up fleshly, and it's just a mess. And Paul has to come in and just hit them hardcore, word for word. Here's the true gospel. This is what I preached unto you. Here's the definition of what the gospel is. Here's the definition of what true repentance is. He's hitting them hard. And he's doing it because he loves them. He wants to see them get saved. He's not exercising lordship over them. He wants to see them get truly saved, born again. Those of you who profess to be saved, you need to check whether you be in the faith. You need to get saved. You need to be born again. Mm -hmm. But she says, you add one lone verse in Corinthians about godly sorrow to the gospel, not realizing you need God to have godly sorrow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let that one sink in. I don't mean to laugh, but it's like one of those things where um, if you're going to go for a bicycle ride, you need a bicycle. It's like, uh, duh, you need a bicycle if you're going to go for a bicycle ride. You know? If you're going to have godly sorrow, there has to be a God, right? Amen. And there is a God. And He saved me. So that kind of got me, got, like as you start blinking, it's like, it really took me off, off guard. Gospel, not realizing you need God to have godly sorrow, as Corinthians was addressed to saved people. So is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where it tells us who, what the gospel is. But that gospel is only for saved people because it was addressed to saved people by their logic. Their sad, I'm sorry, but sad and pathetic ignorance and desire to keep the old man and the old woman. That's what's going on here. Okay. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. That's what she's talking about. 2 Corinthians thir uh, Second Corinthians 7, 9. Verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Sorrows of the world. You can have godly sorrow, or you can have worldly sorrow. You can't have both. Godly sorrow or worldly sorrow. What's it going to be? Okay. Godly sorrow is what makes repentance work. True biblical repentance as it applies to salvation work. Oh yeah. Time and time again, those of us who have been saved and born again, we can testify as a false convert most of my life, part of this easy believism. That's another thing for these people. I'm lost. But back when I was an easy believism believer, I was saved. But somehow I lost my salvation. And they're like, well, you can't lose your salvation. Well, then why, why do you say I'm lost? Why aren't you just saying I'm messed up and I've strayed from the Word of God and I'm, I'm just totally messed up? They'll say I'm lost. I've lost my salvation. No, I was a, I was a false convert. I was never saved with this easy believism junk. Okay? I had to come to God fully broken. We talked about those verses. I had to come broken. I had to fall on the cross so I could become broken. Throw that old man at the foot of the cross. Throw my iniquities at the foot of the cross. Not having worldly sorrow anymore, but godly sorrow. What happens after that? 
after you've repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We talked about it. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. The changed life. New creature in Christ Jesus. What happens when you've truly repented? Not conviction. It's just conviction. No. Godly sorrow. What happens? Verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after, a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourselves in the clearing in this matter. When did Paul ask them? He went to them and said, you guys need to check whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. When they've done this, they've proved themselves. Yep, they're Christians. Yep, they follow the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. That changed life, that living for Jesus Christ, yep. They defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the life they're living, not just the words. They've approved themselves to be clear in this matter. What's wrong with these people that keep attacking? They, they, don't, they don't want to prove themselves because they can't. All they prove is how they still keep the old man, the old woman alive, and they don't want to give up that old man or that old woman. Okay. Right here, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we read, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. If Jesus Christ is in you, then you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. You are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The life that you're living is not going to be the same life that you lived before you got saved. And it's not going from unbelief to belief. It's a physical change. God starts cleaning up your life. Okay? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Jesus turns, out, turns around and says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. His word needs to be here, not up here. It's not about knowing his word. It's about understanding his word. And the evidence that you understand it is you're living it. To change life. Okay? There we see he's telling them to prove themselves. He says that you have to approve yourselves in this matter. You've been approved. But then he goes back and has to rewrite him and say, Hey, you guys are still looking like the lost world, acting like the lost world. You need to prove yourselves. You're not being approved anymore. Okay? You're acting like fools, and some of you are fools. Lost people. Acts 20:21, 20, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I had to throw that one in there real quick because people think we only grab repentance Godly sorrow, he's saying that's what makes repentance work. That's across the board what makes repentance work. And here they're preaching repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. To the lost people. How does that repentance work? Godly sorrow. When does godly sorrow start? It starts at the foot of the cross. And it continues in your life as a Christian. You will have godly sorrow you won't have worldly sorrow anymore. Amen. So there's that attack. Okay, brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm so, I just I love the word of God and I get so frustrated because I care about uh, these people to the point of wanting them to get saved, and they reject the gospel and they reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the life they're living, and they love their old man. They're not dead and buried with Christ. They keep the old man, the old woman alive. It's sad, and it's upsetting. It does get me upset sometimes, especially with people I really love and care about, that they just, they'll stab you in the back, and they'll try to destroy you when all you're doing is trying to preach love to them, God's love that was at the cross, that they need to let go of that old man, that old woman. They need to repent, true biblical repentance, and they won't do it. Last thing that she attacked me on that I really wanted to say something on is every time you see, this is me, she's saying every time I do it, but every time you see the word salvation in the Bible, you think it's talking about eternal salvation. I've never preached that. Every time you see the word salvation, it is God's grace saving man. 
It's God dealing with man and saving him by his, their, by his grace. That's what salvation is every time. Every time. But she's talking about eternal salvation. Well, turn to Philippians 2.9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. One thing, real quick, these people will always hate, is when you bring it to their attention, that you still have to answer to Jesus Christ. You're still going to be judged. There doesn't have to be a change life. You're still going to be judged. If you're saved, truly saved and born again, me and you, brother and sister Christ, we're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. There should be fear. We should be fearing God. Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries. You need to fear God in the life that you're living. Do everything that God tells you to do and fear disobeying Him. Fear displeasing Him. You're going to be judged one day. Right? That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The great white throne, I, I believe with all my heart, not one person is going to stand up there and say, I'm not a sinner. What you're going to see them do is try to say, but I'm not that bad of a person. They're going to try to throw their good works out there to try to get their good works to outweigh the bad. But not one person is going to stand up there and say, I'm not a sinner. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not a sinner. Every last one of them that's going to be on their knees before Jesus Christ at the great white throne, they're going to be trying to plead with their good works to outweigh the bad. Mm -hmm. Verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That fear is the best motivator to do God's work. Okay, and it pleases God when you know that He is the Lord and you treat Him like He is the Lord. And one of the ways you treat Him like He is the capital L Lord is you fear Him. You fear going against His commands. You fear disobeying Him. You fear letting them down. Okay? But we see there, that salvation there is talking about the life of a Christian. You are going to have to answer before Jesus Christ. It's talking about this life period. You're going to have to answer for Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to have to answer to Jesus Christ at the great white throne. But for us that are saved, we're going to have to answer for our life as a Christian. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Salvation in this life are you going to have a life where God's going to give you a lot of peace and a lot of joy? There might be uh, persecutions. But those people that were persecuted, they had peace and joy. Or is your life going to just be the peace is not there because you're just so messed up in sin? Hanging out with the wrong crowd? Fellowshipping with the wrong people? Lost people? You know, that there is no peace, the joy is gone. Peter Ruckman did a great study. Um, I wish he had used more scripture. Uh, maybe someday uh, God will put it on my heart to redo the study and use scripture, but things you can lose as a Christian. And one of the things you can lose is your peace. Another thing you can lose is your joy. You can lose your testimony. You can really mess up your life as a Christian and live a miserable, miserable life. God will chastise you. He'll do his best to get you back on the right track. But there's some people that he's, he'll kill you and bring you home early. He'll just say, you just, you're not listening. Your life is miserable. You're setting a bad example for the brethren. And then he just kills you and brings you home early. And you can make a mess of your life. But the part that it's talking about work out your own salvation is not that whether the chastisement and then Jesus might kill, have to kill you and bring you home early the working out your salvation with fear and trembling is understanding that at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to have to answer for your life as a Christian. 
You need to evaluate your life all the time. Am I doing right? Is there some things I'm holding on to and I'm not letting go of? Okay, I don't always preach that salvation is talking about always talking about eternal salvation. That salvation in this life is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? You missed out on all this peace. You missed out on all this joy. You missed out on a lot of blessings that the Lord had for you in this life. You've gone through a lot of suffering, needless suffering. You weren't suffering for Jesus Christ. That always frustrates me, brother, sister Christ, that you have these people saying, they make mistakes, they make bad choices, and when bad things happen to them, they'll say, I'm suffering for Jesus Christ. No, you're suffering because of the flesh. You're suffering because you chose a different path than what Jesus chose for you. You're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. Okay? It's needless suffering. Okay? You'll have to answer for all that at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.10 I wonder why this is in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Let's start at 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the thing done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And it goes in and says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Would we read over there in Philippians? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. The changed life is not an option. It's guaranteed, and it's going to happen if you're truly saved. Why? Because we just talked about it. You come to God broken. True biblical repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Worketh repentance. That repentance, you continue repenting through your life as a Christian. We read about, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. By the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay? That repentance, that life of repentance, it continues, at the starts at the foot of the cross, and continues until the day you die, and stand before your Lord and Savior. Or we get caught up, the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? It starts at the cross. It's godly sorrow that makes repentance work. Without it, you just have conviction. Like this woman saying, it's only conviction. She's got it. The Pharisees had it. The Sadducees had it. The scribes had it. A lot of lost people today have it, but they don't they love the old man. So So brothers and sisters in Christ, please, please, please. When these people attack you, don't go crazy on them and don't set a bad example for the body of Christ. Preach the plan of salvation to them again. Maybe this time they'll listen. And then, if not, move on. Okay? Uh, let them alone. They'd be blind leaders of the blind. I linked to someone about dusting the feet off, dust off your feet. And you move on to the next city. Okay? You move on. Don't get stuck. I preached the plan of salvation to this woman multiple times. I've pleaded with this woman, and she just rejects the plan of salvation. She likes the old woman. She ain't giving that old woman up. And she's very prideful. Her picture is very prideful. She used to have a meek, mild, humble picture. And now it's just pride. Pride, pride, pride. She goes about to establish her own self-righteousness. And if she dies in her sins, she will go to hell and burn for all eternity. My heart's desire is not that people die and go to hell. Up here, I understand it's going to happen. Down here, my heart's desire is I need to get busy working for the Lord. I need to get out there. In these last days, it seems like nobody wants to throw that old man or that old woman at the foot of the cross. Nobody does. Nobody wants anything to do with the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. They're being fed this lie, this worldly lie, that you can keep the old man, you can have the world, and you can be a Christian. 
All you have to do is believe. Just You just believe. That's it. And yes, there's sometimes people try to push the easy prayers. And all you have to do is say this prayer and you're saved. No repentance. The belief is just head knowledge. It's not down here. Yes, sometimes people can be pushed into that. Okay, the prayer doesn't save you. Repentance doesn't save you. Your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross doesn't save you. God is the one that saves you, and He saves you by His grace. So I could Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. God's the one that does the saving. We've always preach that. But we see this world, brothers and sisters, Christ, and they just, they don't, they want that old man, they love that old man, they love that old woman. They ain't throwing it at the foot of the cross. They ain't going to be, uh, they're not going to let that old man and that old woman be crucified with Christ and see the new man or the new woman be resurrected with Jesus Christ. Um, sorry, forgot to mute that. We oh, yeah, got this. But we're at an end here. I don't need to keep babbling. I'm not, hopefully I'm not babbling, but sometimes I can get to the point where I start babbling when we're done. So brothers and sisters in Christ, stick to the word, stand your ground. You've got that new life in Christ Jesus. Don't let anybody try to get you to resurrect the old man. Don't let anybody try to get you to turn your back on the word of God. Stand, 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 brothers and sisters of Christ. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. P.S. We're going to get into more Bible lists, and we're going to get into the Lord is King, soldiers, and we're going to get into the armor of God. I think that's a good direction we should be going in. So, see you guys in the next study.